Hello. Um, it is so great to be in Berlin. Um, if not for any other reason, then this is the first stage I've ever arrived onto with a full refrigerator full of um, Red Bull. And having been out last night to uh, Watergate, I, I fully understand why that is there. <laughs> um, so I'm, I'm a lawyer in California, and um, I've always wanted to be a lawyer. Since I was five years old, um, I knew this was my profession. By the age of 12, I knew I wanted to be an IP lawyer. Um, so when this day happened, uh, this is actually the day after my law school graduation, this is my grandpa, um, I call him Gong Gong, he's um, my mother's father from southern China, and here I am, I put my um, doctorate lapel on him, he, he was too sick to come to my graduation, so the next day I went to see him, and um, he was so proud of me, I was, I'm the first in the family to have a professional degree. Um, and it was, so, it was something he knew I wanted my whole life. Um, but during, in this picture, you know, I'm, I'm actually really seething inside because it was something I wanted my whole life, but something didn't feel right in this moment. Um, I was thinking about what to do with my career, and, and I actually had been in, working in the legal profession for about eight years before going to law school, so I had an idea that there was this shift happening. Um, I felt inadequate uh, to meet this shift, and when I looked at my options, I you know, could go back to a law firm and do the billable hour and the reading and writing um, and just sit at my desk all day. Um, Oh, and one thing to mention, I'm, I'm $95,000 in debt, in law school debt here. Um, so, so, so the law firm job to me at this point is twofold. It's a way to dig out of debt um, and to, to quote, be a lawyer. Um, I could go in-house, I could go work for a large corporation, um, make a good income, and if I'm lucky, maybe get some stock options. I could go into government, uh, which would inevitably probably lead me into more debt because right now the government doesn't pay that well, but, um, but at least I'd be doing something for the people, and that was always a big motivation. Or I could do something totally different and throw my law school degree away and just say, gong gong, I know I work so hard for this, but I'm just gonna do something else. <laughs> um, so these, these were pretty much, you know, th that's what's going through my head in this picture. Um, and, and so then I do the research and I'm like, okay, what is a lawyer? And what comes up is lawyers are scum, liars, evil, le least likely to do this. I don't know what this is. I never figured that out. <laughs> um, then I, I was like, oh, but what is the law? And, and quite frankly, people are more enthusiastic about what law is. It's spiritual, uh, reason free from passion. Um, the law is the law. It is what it is. <laughs> And then I, I wanted to understand, you know, okay, law and government, what, is there something I could do there? Um, and, and you get mixed reviews. The government is watching, it's a lie. The government is bees. I don't really understand that. Maybe, Sergey, you could explain that what to be. Um, and then courts. Courts are corrupt. Uh, first, first result that comes up. And no wonder. Look at our statistics. Greater than 86% of legal needs go unmet in the United States. That's people who have showed they have a legal need, have expressed it in some way. It's been tracked by Law Services Corporation in the United States. 86%, um, that's a large number of people that can't get legal help. Um, the U.S. has the highest incarceration rate in the world. Um, we're basically like a corporate prison now, um, housing over 22% of the world's prisoners. Um, and then this is my field of, of IP that I was so excited about. And when I learned this, I was, I was you know, just so deflated. But 96% of patents are of no commercial value today. Um, the top 1% of companies own roughly more than 70% of the patents that are in use. So we, we have um, a patent system, which is a temporary monopoly for innovation, but quite frankly, um, they're being monopolized. So, so there really is an equal access to innovation today. 
And then here's another area of the law that, uh, that's been coming under question, marriages even. More than half of marriages end in divorce. This is a, this is a government legal institution of marriage. 60% um, of married people say they are dissatisfied with the institution, so much so that millennials, people my generation, are marrying at a rate 200 times lower, slower than baby boomers. So there's not a lot of trust going on. Um, and we know that because there's a statistic on trust. 17% of people um, are happy. This is the people that are happy with the current government. That means over 80% are not happy with it. Um, and then it, that 80% of Americans say they don't trust the government. So that's a lot of information to then go into the world with. And, and I don't think I could in my right mind just go to a law firm or go to an in-house department. Um, I, I deeply felt in order to be a real lawyer, to do the thing that I set out to do when I was a child, I needed to do something different. And so I came up with this hypothetical formula um, that really I think what's happening here is that lawyers plus a poor legal infrastructure equals a system with increasing social entropy. So what's social entropy? It's a measure um, of the natural decay within a social system. It can refer to the decomposition of social structure um, or of the disappearance of social distinctions. So, you know, the lawyer, being a lawyer used to mean something. Um, it used to mean that you protected the Constitution. It meant that you protected people. It, it, you had this, you know, higher order task in society. But when I graduated and what I see a lot of my peers doing is, is, not, is not what we would historically consider lawyers to be to be useful for. Um, so going back to first principles, um, I think we need to rethink legal infrastructure entirely. So when you add compu increased computational capacity, I think something shifts. I think we give back to the lawyer something that maybe our existing structures um, over time have, have decayed. So my home for this was and I kind of like got away with not doing any of those four things, law firm in-house. I got away with this kind of intermediate academic route. Um, there's a center at Stanford called Codex. It's the first center uh, that has combined legal education with computer science. It's been around for 10 years, but really it was only about six guys sitting in a room until about uh, five years ago. Um, so here's a place now that I had the opportunity to talk with people that were really trying to understand what the future of law is going to look like. Um, so there's conferences, there's a curriculum, and this is the actual real poster uh, that they posted all across the law school to get students to take this class. Um, the dean was a little concerned that there was a robot sitting at a computer and uh, called us up and they're like, what, what, what is this? Is this robot going to be teaching the class? Um, we said no, no, it was just, you know, trying to capture the imagination. Um, so the conversation really is around what happens when you combine human decisions with machine predictions. And um, there's a lot of speculation that AI is going to take jobs away, but what's really missing from the conversation is um, really, you know, how we can think about advancements in legal technology in the terms of a lawyer's efficiency, and how can we view these advancements within the context of real socioeconomic change. And that's where things get really interesting. Um, so my work stems from the idea that transaction costs, so how much it costs to do something um, determines whether or not that thing is ever going to happen. So if it's too expensive to order an Uber, you're just not gonna order that Uber. If it takes you too long, you're just not gonna do it. So technology is really good at taking away that cost so that you make decisions differently. Um, this was a theory actually that was first really put in the academic literature in the 30s. Um, then there was this other theorists in, in the 90s that said, well, lawyers are actually engineering all of this. So regul regulatory structures, um, lawyers, people that like read stuff and sit at desks, they're actually trying to figure out how we can all do these transactions um, and how we can do them at a lower cost so that they become economically feasible options. 
So to finish this theory, um, when you supplement what a lawyer does with technology, you actually have one of the most sophisticated um, economic levers uh, because now you're reducing the cost of transactions um, across the board, you're re-examining regulatory structures and you're actually enabling activities that would otherwise never be um, permissible. And the only thing that is imperfect about this theory is that my name is not Ronald. It's Ronald, Ronald, Nicole theory, so. <laughs> Um, and we're seeing this already in the, in the legal technology space. In, um, in London and New York, there was a 19-year-old kid that created a chatbot that was paying parking tickets. And it paid um, over 100,000 parking tickets in a year. There's an AI that can assess um, predictions for judges. And, and, and in comparisons, there's one paper that actually showed that a certain um, computation was actually better than judges in determining whether someone was going to recommit an offense. And in the financial sector, we're seeing uh, financial institutions choosing uh, AI tools to do legal tasks at, at an incredible scale. Um, JP Morgan software does in seconds what it took lawyers over 300,000 hours to do. So boiling it down, it's really there's three core drivers for legal technology today. It's optimizing the exchange of information, setting consistent expectations between parties, and mitigating errors. So when I sit down to build legal software, I make sure that every step in the process, um, every tool, every time we talk about the tool, every marketing um, meeting we have, we go through and we start with these first principles. So our job is to mimic the cognitive process of lawyers using software. And for the first time ever, this is all technically feasible. Um, so this next part of my talk really is about why AI is so well suited for the practice of law. Um, I created this pyramid of, of, of AI um, with machine learning and logical automation as kind of foundational pieces, and then this hypothetical general AI. So it, it, general AI does not exist today. Um, but it's some hypothetical program that can do any human intellectual task. Um, data, data storage has made this possible, and, and that's why we've seen so many advancements over the last couple of years. Um, so, law practice is really in two parts. One is answering questions that only have one right answer. And in this case, um, computational logic or rules-based AI is really, really great for this. So this is statutory rules, this is filing, this is clerical tasks. So this is really about 60% of the law firm is, is doing um, effectively um, computational logic. And so with ClearAccess IP, my, my company, we have uh, two sets of AI. One is computational logic for just managing documents, um, deadlines, statutory rules, and the like. And then the other is machine learning. So machine learning is really the breakthrough that is making this stuff interesting. Because machine learning is capable of doing the hard task of finding the best answer. Some things just don't have one right answer. Um, and oftentimes in the law, there's this gray area, and that's what lawyers are really good at, is debating and arguing, arguing, and pushing your way through this gray area to come up with what is effectively the best answer. So in the case of, you know, I'm hearing a lot of Bitcoin regulation um, right now. In the case of Bitcoin, we, we just really don't, governments don't really know how to regulate Bitcoin yet. Um, and at this point, we're really struggling to find case law that gives us that right best answer. So machine learning is one of these things that you can put in an enormous amount of information, you can put in policy goals. Oh, yes. Um, I think I'm out of time. <laughs> but, but in effect, 
These machines are very, very good at higher, higher order intellectual tasks. This is a picture of the entire patent corpus that we're working with at ClearAccess IP. Um, there's about 30 billion concepts represented in our patent corpus. And this is just the highest level visualization of that using TensorFlow. So where are we today? This stuff is really painful and slow, but my prediction is general AI might feel rather sudden in the next five to 10 years. Um, and there's lots of legal technologies that are taking advantage of this today. Oh, will AI replace lawyers? I really don't know. <laughs> I have no idea. But um, a wise judge once told me, we will never reach the stars without computer, but we'll never celebrate the success absent humankind. Thank you. So we have time for potentially one question, maybe two from, uh, from the audience. You had a crazy amount of questions. People are very, very much dying to talk to you. Um, we'll go with the most upvoted one, if that's cool. okay for you. Yeah, let's do it. Uh, so the question was, is the digitalization of lawyering changing the reputation of lawyers to a greater good? Uh, I think the tense of this question is, is, so is it now? No, it isn't right now. Um, a lot of lawyers are very um, hard to change. And I think today um, it is not actually changing the reputation of lawyers. That search that I ran, um, lawyers are scum, was two days ago. <laughs> so, um, but I do think it will. I do, I do think it will. It must. <laughs> Uh, and then the, qu the second question, um, what's the degree of automation you foresee towards tasks undertaken by a lawyer? And uh, do you see potential in a digital platform for pro bono legal assistance? Absolutely. Um, in fact, there's been a few uh, projects coming out of Stanford. So Legal.io is the first um, private company that's working with the state bar pro bono organizations. And um, they're about six years in, and they've served um, about, I believe, 9, 000, over 9,000 parties. Wow, that's intense. Yeah. Very cool. Uh, so we're out of time. Thank you very, very much. Um, okay. Will you be walking around doing an AMA or anything else uh, for all the people that didn't get to ask that question? Sure, yeah, we'll be here for sure. Okay, okay. so Thanks. grab her later. Yeah. Thanks again.